Hi, I'm Jay Horsey, host of the Swell Country Podcast, uh, co-creator of the Swellverse Network, creator of the Eins Anthology, lots of web comics out there, and you're listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a returning guest. He hasn't been on the show for a couple of years because the bugger is busy as all hell with his Spoiler Country podcast and show, as well as 10 other shows that he's running as well too but there's five that we'll talk about here today we're joined today by the ever talented jay horsley how are you doing today jay i'm doing good man thanks for having me back on appreciate and, it and at least i said your show right this time instead of county you know? right <laughs> i would laugh hard about that that's that funny <laughs> we've known each other for a while i've known you've done a podcast for a long time as well too so it's good to have you back to talk shop basically for this here for those that have never heard about of course spoiler country or anything along that line how did it start and what is your role so spoiler country started as a conversation between uh my wife's uncle and myself um he's like one of my best friends uh he's big into comics he's a nerd um he's a couple years older than me uh we would talk at like family functions about comic books and movies stuff all the time and then one day we're like we should do a podcast we should do our youtube show or something and um we started planning for that, and then uh, eventually we went and saw Kevin Smith in Bellevue, and uh, the end of Kevin Smith's show was like, hey, if you want to do something, just do it. You might fail, but if you failed, at least you know you tried, and we walked out of that show going, screw it, let's do it. So we started our show. Uh, we recorded our first episode on uh, July 2nd, 2017, and then released it, and then we've been going like crazy since then. Um, so Splat Crunch has been going strong since July of 2017. Uh, we're four years in now, and uh, you know we're over. We're about to hit episode eight hundred here pretty soon, nice. and uh, we're you know going kind of crazy. So let's put this into perspective, okay? <laughs> so just so that everyone knows how difficult it is to get eight hundred episodes, I don't know how far back it was for Two Geeks Talking, but we've passed our thousandth ep episode a while back. I I don't know when. I don't know. I can't tell you who the thousandth person was, <laughs> but you've almost reached this point with a thousand interviews in almost half the time that we've been running for 12 years. Fucking incredible. So congratulations on that. That's a, that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We're nothing if we're not, you know, tenacious about getting stuff done. <laughs> it started with just the two of us and it's ballooned up to now we have six people who do interviews with us um, and a whole team behind the scenes working on the website and other stuff. Uh, that's kind of crazy because it's literally just two guys being nerds you know we started talking just about comic books and movies and all that kind of stuff then we started getting guests on and then now we got a a, a, a booking agent for um booking people for us we've got you know three people that aren't kendrick or me doing interviews with us uh we do topic shows we have sub shows on our i mean it's it's kind of crazy I and mean, we haphazardly in inadvertently started a podcast network you know it wasn't on purpose but it just kind of happened um that's going really well and uh it's it's kind of crazy because we this is just a hobby for fun. It's turned into something a little more serious. I'm very humble about how, one, how much we've been able to do in the last four years, and two, the amount of people we've talked to and who we've talked to is, is, is humbling. Now, you've had a lot of really great guests. I mean, whoever your agent is, I might have to pick their brain about this because, uh, <laughs> you know, I've been doing this solo. The fact that you've got a great person that's gathering you amazing guests, truly amazing guests, like you're, you're, uh, you're pushing me to, to do things that I haven't done in a while. So darn you and thank you. So <laughs> You're welcome, I do appreciate it. <laughs> but talk about some of your, your favorite guests that you've had on the show. Obviously, I mean, four years is not a lot of time to put 800 episodes. So that's what, yeah. 200 a year, basically? That's that's incredible. Roughly, yeah. Roughly. yeah. Like, who are some of your favorite guests that you've had to, uh, you yourself have had a chance to talk with? I think my all-time favorite guest was John Wesley Shipp, Flash's dad from the Flash TV show, Flash from the 90s. And I think it was because his episode was so much fun for me uh, because he opened up to us a lot about uh, his past and about some stuff that happened when he was a kid and his dad. And it all happened because Kendrick and I watched some interviews before uh, we talked to him. And he, he mentioned this story about his, his childhood, about somebody shooting a shotgun into his living room, like of his, of his childhood home at his dad. And the interviews we watched, nobody ever pressed that story further, really. Uh, he told some about it some in places, but he never nobody ever like 
not pressed it, but asked him follow up questions about it. They kind of said, oh, that, that's tragic or whatever. And um, we asked him about it and we, you know, we, we walked into it and like, hey, we want to know more what happened. And he told us this amazing story about his dad and racism in the 60s and 70s and his dad standing up for this and his, and his house getting shot into and not affecting his dad because it has dad's like, no, we're here to help people. And this beautiful story. And um, it just ended up being one of my favorites because it we walked out of it with I felt like I walked out of that one knowing something new, you know, learning something. And I, that's what I love. Um, it was the same way with Stephen Frank. And we had Stephen Frank on who was the uh, he was the animation director for the Iron Giant. He has a great book out called Silver, which you haven't, you haven't read that one. Read it. It's uh, four volumes. It's fantastic. It's basically Ocean's Eleven, Ocean's Eleven in uh, Dracula's castle. It's so good. Nice. And um, his from him, you know, we found out that his grandfather escaped Auschwitz twice in mm-hmm. World War Two. And it's just an incredible story. And, you know, it's it's one of the things that I feel like our show does um, is we we don't ask we ask questions about like their people's careers and what they're working on, what they're working on now, obviously. Uh, but we always try and um, go more personal and, and try, like, you know, let them talk about things they don't normally get to talk about in interviews because. Well, the way I personally feel about it is I love hearing people's stories. I love I, mean, I love obviously people create whether it's music or art or movies or whatever. But I like to hear the stories behind all that, right? Like, how do they, why are they there? How do they get to that point? You know, stuff like that. And one of the things I think that we do well is we're able to pull that out of people um, in natural conversation, right? Just, just naturally way of the way Kendrick and I talk to people, it, it all automatically becomes more personal because just because of who we are. And uh, it's, it ends up being this great conversation. I mean, I, you know me. I've had, yeah. You and I have had great open conversations oh, yeah. on my show and on your show. It just naturally goes into realms of just – getting out this great thing and it I always feel better after these conversations. And I think that's one of the things that, that like one of the way Kendrick and I talk to each other and the way we talk to other people, it, it just, it helps bring us to, we have our own sound, you know, but being an interview, obviously you, you understand this. And I don't think a lot of people truly understand being on this side of the, of, of the microphone. You're, it's not that you're trying to fill time. It's that you're trying to find, the right answers to the questions you're trying to ask. It comes down to, like you said, pulling the story out of uh, John Wesley Snipes there. You know, it was, for me, it was interviewing uh, Brock Easley when he was talking about creating Speedy, you know, and and the comic with, uh, which was the character representing his daughter, you know, with the with the disability, and he brought that story too. So, that's like opening a door to a person's soul that you you just kind of happen to stumble upon or stumble through. Yep, exactly. It's great, exactly. <laughs> and it's a great feeling too, especially when you walk out of. It. I love it too because sometimes I walk into interviews not knowing a lot about a lot, not knowing a lot about the person I'm talking to. Right, uh, I'll know a little bit. I mean, I've done my research, you know, or I've got the the write up for them. But I like it when I'm able to have a conversation with them and like halfway through, it's like I'm talking to an old friend for somebody I've never met or knew anything about when I started the conversation. And in that conversation, it's like, man, this was a lot of fun. Like that's the one thing I hear a lot in, on our show is from people at, at the end of it is like, man, this was a lot more fun than I expected it to be, which is exactly what I always want to hear from everybody we talk to at the end of the show. But it comes down to to comfort as well too. You're right. Yeah. You have you have a very limited window usually, especially even if you schedule in advance. You still have life. You still have to find that balance between your life and and the show itself. And you have to figure out what can I take the time to research on and, and research about this person that I can gather you know five or ten questions to to get them to fill a half hour to an hour. Yeah, exactly, exactly. My my approach when I I don't do a lot of interviews personally anymore. Um, most of what I do at the spoiler country these days is, um, I do all of the back end work. Um, I build the website. I do like 95% of all the audio and video editing. I handle all of the posting. I make all of the graphics. I do all that stuff. And that's specifically because we do a lot of interviews and we have other people to do the interviews. So I focus on all the back end stuff. Now I do a lot of our other types of shows. You know, we have interview shows. We have, we have the make my Marvel TV subseries, which is basically, uh, Kenrick, myself, our friend Sumner and Casey. I'll meet up and talk about the current Marvel TV show or movie or whatever. Um, Kendrick and I do things called Tots, Tangent of Tangents, where it's just us BSing about, you know, whatever. Um, I'll do those shows. And I'll, I'll hop on some interviews now and then, but most of my time lately has been spent doing all of the back end work, uh, mostly because I've found how to kind of like streamline that really well. I, I'm a firm believer in using people's skill sets to match what they need to be doing. 
And since I've been able to streamline all that stuff, I, I, I do that and then people do the interviews. And I, I hop in the ones I want to do. If Ron Randall or Carl Kessler comes on, two of my friends, um, I'll, I'll hop on to interview them because I love talking to them. It's just the way it goes, you know. You've done a lot in the short amount of time and that's that's great to see. And, and the fact that, you know, people who've known you and, and who know about you and who've heard your show, heard you on our show as well, you know, know that you're into comics, that you're into creating comics, you're into writing, you're into doing all of these other things. The fact that, you know, you're married with an amazing family and that you still keep producing this top quality content is just great to see as well as, you know, the fact that I don't know how you sleep to be perfectly honest. <laughs> Short spurts of it. I don't know. Um, I, I, yeah, you're right. I love doing making comics. I mean, when, when I first met you, I was doing web comics and yeah. uh, you know, I was doing Y2CL and inanimate and, and I think I had like seven web comics I, I was doing yeah. at the time. And you told me I was insane and you're not wrong. I was, mm -hmm. um, and then it lost, you know, I, I created the Eins Anthology, which I'm actually working on um, the uh, sketch covers for Ooh. You can't really that, but yeah, it's yeah. one of them I did uh, for the Eins Anthology. And then like I did this one recently too. Yeah, I'm working on the sketch covers for the, the backers and a bunch more stuff while I'm sitting here. And then I'm working on launching book two here pretty soon for that. Nice. Uh, and I got like three other books in line that I'm going to launch, but I'm not going to launch them until I get other stuff done, you know. I'm the kind of person, as you know from our previous talks and knowing me for 12, 15 years, however long, however long it's been. I can't not be doing stuff creative. I go crazy. Like I have to be doing, I have to be drawing something. I have to be doing the podcast stuff or writing or, or something creative or I just, I just go insane. I, I can't sit idle. I don't like sitting idle for anything. Uh, it's just my personality. When I do sit idle, I, I feel guilty sitting and watching TV if I'm not doing something while I'm watching TV because I feel like I'm wasting time. If I'm not like drawing while watching TV or researching something while I'm watching TV or doing some or work, or even do my actual work at my, my job. While I'm watching TV or something, I feel I feel guilty because I feel like this is time that I could be using to do get something accomplished. Now I know there's, there's I'm working on this whole there's the importance of learning how to relax, right? And learning how to like just let your mind go at ease. That's not super easy for me, so I got to find ways to make that happen. But for my web comics, you know, I created over three thousand pages of web comics that I have sitting here on the computer. I've I've published, you know. A couple of books here and there in the Eins Anthology, which was a bit of an undertaking. It's more more of an undertaking than I thought it was going to be when I started it. <laughs> and then the podcast, this, you know, Spoiler Country, and then my Haphazard podcast, and then the Y2CO radio podcast that I do, which is just me talking, and then the whole Spoiler First Network thing. You know, there's a lot going on. It's the way I like it, man. I, I like to be busy. I don't like I don't like to be idle with nothing to do. I like to always have something that I work best under pressure. So I, I keep myself under pressure. Now, do I 100% do everything perfectly and everything go great? No, things fall, things fail, and that's fine. Like things have to fail so other things can succeed. But the way I see it for me is if I don't have all these things and have something fail, I don't know what's going to succeed and what's going to fail if I just try and put too much in something that's going to fail. So for me, it works out. So why can't you relax? I don't know. I've never been able to sit and relax. I mean, the only time I honestly, the only time I've been really to, able to relax with weed, you know, if I, and I don't smoke weed a lot, but, or really ever, but like, if I do that, then I can shut my brain off. But besides that, I just, I have this constant need to just be busy. Uh, even when I'm laying in bed at night, going, going to bed, I'm still on my phone researching comics, researching stories for the book or researching stuff for the podcast, or just like, doing something interactive or research on my, my comic book collection for values or stuff I want to buy, you know, shit like that. I just always have to be going, 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 going. And it's just, it's just the natural order of, of what I do. And I, I kind of feel bad for my kids because some of my kids have the same go, go, go mentality. And I see it in them and I'm like, this can be great, but we, you gotta, you gotta learn to prioritize, which is something I still struggle with is learning how to prioritize what needs to be done now versus what needs to be done. It's easiest. It's a really hard balance that I'm even at almost 40 years old. I'm still trying to figure out. I've interviewed a lot of people in 12 years. Like you've interviewed a lot of people in 12 years. Do you can see similarities in your own personalities and different traits of how people work? People that are driven to constantly create like you are, like myself, like a lot of other people that we know in the same circles, whether or not it's, it's just how they're wired or whether or not it's a deeper, you're still putting content into the world. You're still cr putting yourself into the world and whether it, whether or not it sticks or whether or not, you know, you think it's the best thing ever or whether or not you just needed to put something out there of yourself, you know, mm -hmm. people are still going to look at it and they're still going to, you know, ad admire you for what you're able to create. So there's positive and negative to that type of mindset, but yeah. you're, you're taking it to a positive aspect where you're constantly creating and constantly making great stuff. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And for me, to kind of go back on what you said there, for me personally, like, I would love to have my creation stuff, like my comics, my writing, my podcast, all this stuff that I do, um, be a career and make money off of it. But if I'm being 100% honest with anybody, and I've, I'll tell this to you because we're friends on your show, I don't care. Like, I create my books and all this stuff. It's 99% for me um, because I want to get it out there. I would love to make money on my books and all this stuff, but honestly, I don't really care. If I can just get out there and get people to read it, I'm happy. Like, I've given away so many books and so much stuff to people just so they could read it. Uh, that it's, it's not for me, it's not about making money. It's about getting these creative ideas out of my head onto paper and um, having something to show for these, all these ideas I have in my head. And same thing with music. Like I've, I've recorded so many songs and like, I've never once tried to make money off them because I won. I just don't, I mean, I care about money, but like I got a really good job. So I don't really need to make money off of this stuff. I mean, I would love to, again, trust me, I would love to be able to sell this book and become a millionaire, you know, be awesome or make a living off of it. But that's not why I made it. I made the book because I had this idea and this story I wanted to get out. And I'm just happy. I'm just as happy as selling somebody a copy of the book as I am giving somebody a copy and then reading it and telling what they think, you know, and it's all it's same, same with the podcast. Like I would love to make money on the podcast and we, we do make money off of ads and stuff like that. And that's fine. But for me, it's about, I have this creative drive and I've just, and I satisfy that urge by creating this content and getting out to the world and getting the feedback positive and negative for feedback on everything I create, which is fine. I'm, I, you know, I take positive and negative feedback on anything I create and I, I try to use that to, to improve. But for me, it's just really about getting it out there and people seeing it or reading it or, or just sharing my ideas and my, myself with the world. That's the reward for me. Again, I would love to make money off this stuff. My personal goal is just to satisfy these urges in my head to make these things happen. From a technological standpoint, obviously, when I started this show, I was using something called TalkShoe. That's actually still yeah. around. It's part of the I Blue remember. <laughs> it's part of the Blueberry Network. It was the shittiest audio quality ever. Like Dude, it was, I remember the role. The doo 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 talk shoe. <laughs> yeah. How not to plug your show. You're listening to Talk Shoe. It's like okay, right. cool. Am I on now? No. Uh, all right. It was so bad. The audio quality was so bad on that thing. God, it must have been like six four her the sixty four whatever like it was 12, anyhow. Man, bad. anyways yeah, yeah. The long story short is when they wiped out my archive which was 10 years of content which still pisses me off by the way which happened to mo uh, several people yeah like and they're like oh well you could just re-upload it what if i had lost it all yeah which is why i've always meticulously backed up all of my shit because i don't want to lose anything <laughs> well i have six hard drives and they probably have a copy each of this of my past interviews yeah. but technology has improved a lot i mean we're using zoom currently here obviously there was the google uh the google chat area that yep. had its aspects skype was a huge thing part of the show for a while too how about yourself in terms of t technology what are you using for your podcast and what are you using for your interviews your video <laughs> interviews i should say yeah so uh we use a variety of stuff um essentially uh we have um, Kendrick and I both have a, a, a Zoom um, L8 live track mixer, which allows us to record basically anything. It has mixed my I can record a, I can record something on the, on my cell phone. Um, I can uh, record three way call. I, I can record eight tracks on this thing individually. It, it's a, an amazing recorder. So we're doing just audio. You know, whether it's through Zoom or Skype or a, a phone call, I'll use the the L8 and record on that. And I always use that to back up audio recording. It was, actually, I'm recording this conversation on it right now as a backup for us audio. But for video stuff, it, de it really depends on what the person we're talking to wants. We try and push Zoom because uh, Zoom is the easiest to use right now. Um, everybody uses it because of the whole pandemic and it's like the, the, the go-to video conferencing thing. So it, people know how to use it. And Zoom did just upgrade their quality on stuff, which is nice. But we use Zoom for most of that. Well, we'll do Skype if, for video and for stuff. If they don't have Zoom or refuse to do Zoom, we'll do Skype. Even though Skype video quality is complete shit. And then we have Zoom set up to where it records multiple tracks for audio. And then I have a bunch of processing stuff that I do in the back end to process the audio and process the video to make it look better and sound better. We're working on setting up a way for when like Kendrick and I talk back just the two of us, succinct files locally in high def to where it's not like the Zoom quality video. We can upgrade that a little bit. We haven't had much success in that, but we honestly also haven't put a lot of effort into it yet because we've been so busy. I'm like 90% sure I know exactly what we need to do. We just have not been able to do it yet, you know, test it out. You know, as you know, I'm so freaking busy with work and kids and all this other stuff. Outside of Zoom, you know, we'll take it and I'll throw it into, I take the audio tracks, I throw them into Audacity, I convert them to WAV files. 
um, I run a plugin called um, RX uh, Voice to Noise that kind of goes through the audio clips and takes out any kind of like artifacts. It really cleans up the audio pretty well. Once it's through that, I export both tracks as a wave. Take those two tracks. I'll run each one of them separately through a program called Levelator. It takes your sound and makes them level to one high. So there's no peaking, no lows. So if, if like, let's say I'm talking like this and then I, I come out and I talk like this and I come in like this, it'll level all that out for you. And it'll make it sound really good. And it's like, it's about 97, 98% accurate. Meaning like out of every hundred files I do, I might have like one or two that have a weird peak in them for some reason, um, but nothing major. As long as you don't level like music and it's just like vocal tracks or talking, it does a really, really good job. So then I have, you know, two tracks that are both levelated and RX voice to noise. So that it's, it's cleaned up like probably 90% of all the artifacts and nasty shit in audio. I take both those tracks back in, I throw them back into Audacity or, or really any audio editor, but I use Audacity because it's free. And I don't use the new Audacity, the 3.0 with all the weird stuff. And I use, I use an older version that doesn't have any of the weird privacy concerns that's going on right now. Throw them back into there and then I take them and I'll mix them out as one track, as a combined track. And then I take that combined track and I throw it into a program called Descript. Now, if I have video with the, like this, like if I was doing this one here, I'd have that audio track. Now I have one clean track of a combined of both people talking, cleaned up and ready to go. I'll take the video track as well from this and I'll throw both those into, into Descript. And what Descript does is Descript also cleans stuff up as well. So it'll pick up any of the artifacts and left over from the other two and clean those up for us. It'll also transcribe the whole podcast into text. Um, oh. and then I can take the audio file and the video file and I can create a, um, a composition out of those two to where it syncs them up and just turn off the audio from the video file to where I have the audio from my cleanup audio file and the video from my video file synced up, ready to go. And then I can edit it that way. Um, I can edit as just a straight text file or I can edit it like you do, I could do uh, any kind of other video program. But what's really cool about Descript, why I use it is you can actually highlight all the audio, all, all the text and you can go to remove filler words and I can say remove all the hums, ums, and ah, ums, and ahs, and ohs, and all kind of crap stuff. It'll go through and it will delete all of the filler words. Like if I was to go, um, um, it would cut that out for me like automatically. And it also has, it also does boundary um, fixing. So it'll edit them out, but then it'll go through and it'll take you, editing it out takes like a minute, but then it'll spend like 10 minutes going through all the boundaries of the, of the filler words that it cut out and it will fix the boundaries so it doesn't sound like it's being chopped up. It'll clean it up to where it sounds you know, relatively good. And if you listen to any interviews we've done on Soil Crunch in the last probably year, they've all been edited that way. So if you haven't noticed any weird things in it, it's because the program is doing a damn good job of what it's doing. Once that's done, I export the video out of there as well as the, the transcript. So I have a transcript on the website of, of what everybody says. And the transcript is like 90% accurate. Some of the words don't make sense, but I mean, if you read through it, it kind of, you can follow along. I have, then I have a video file that's edited down, ready to go. I take that video file, I'll throw it into DaVinci Resolve, and then I'll add all my like fancy stuff to it there to where it's like, you know, adding the names and the, the bottom text thing and like the intro and the outro and stuff like that in DaVinci. Export out of DaVinci. I have the DaVinci MP4 file, which is my video file. Upload it to YouTube. I'll drop that back into Audacity, export that as an MP3, upload that to the website. And then I've got my video on YouTube and I've got my audio on the website for the podcatchers. And that's kind of like the quick way of how I do all the editing. Most of this, as if, if you probably picked up on that, most of this is like not actively editing. It's drop a file, let it do its thing. Drop a file, let it do its thing. Most of my active editing comes when I'm doing, put, putting the video stuff on there. But really, unless I want to add fancy stuff like cuts and stuff like that, I don't really have to do a lot because the video is already done. And most of what I do is I don't have time for it. I don't do a lot of fancy stuff to it. I'll put transitions and kind of add stuff where it makes sense. I don't go through and add, I don't do like what like people do and I add a lot of like pop-up stuff and I wish I could, I don't have time for it, but it's pretty simple to do. A lot of it's passive editing. Really, even, even DaVinci doing that, adding the intro, the outro and all the cuts and the intros are the uh, transitions, 15 minutes and then export it. And the, the render, DaVinci actually renders off my computer. Uh, an hour long video podcast will render in about 40, 45 minutes. That's so it's, I mean, then it's just, and I can still do other stuff while I'm doing that. I still, it's kind of crazy. I have, I have four monitors set up here. I've got like, you know, two right here and two over here. And so I'll have like the one up here editing DaVinci and stuff like that. I'll have the one over here editing and uh, editing audio. So I'll be like processing multiple files at one time. It's kind of, it gets, it gets kind of crazy. Yeah. It's kind of the process graphics. Um, I have a template made for graphics. I also, I have a template in DaVinci too. So really I just drop it in there, put the file there, clean some stuff up and it's good to go. Templates are the best, but for my graphics, I have a template. So I just drop a file and I drop a graphic into the, into the Photoshop change the text for like who we're talking to, whatever it's about. Um, I might do some like 
fancy, not, not really fancy, but do some kind of editing on the photo to make it like pop, cut the person out and change the background to black and white or, or put a glow on it, just something to make it like pop. And then I save it out and that takes me like a minute to maybe 10 minutes if I'm doing something fancy with the, with the graphic. Yeah. And then it's done. Like 90% of my editing of stuff is really all passive background stuff. It just takes time. Like each, each plugin takes time, you know, 10, 20, 30 minutes to run, but I'm not actively doing anything. I just have it processing and then I'm coming back over here doing other stuff, have it processing. I'm talking about technical stuff here, man. I've got in my garage, I have five rack mount servers um, set up with uh, 396 gigs of RAM and an on and I think I have 192 CPUs I run on them. I have virtual machines set up on those. And sometimes when I'm really deep into it, I'll have virtual machines going and I'll have audio files processing on, on various virtual machines. We have 800, almost 800 episodes. You know, we've got probably 50 in the queue waiting to go up. So I'll have to, I'll be, I'll want to get a bunch done in a day. So I'll have time. So I'll be processing the three or four at a time on various virtual machines just to get them through the next step so I can get them, get, so I can get them posted. So those virtual machines really help out to be able to like, you know, mass produce things over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've learned something new. Descriptor. That's uh it's wow. an amazing program, man. It's I, if you're not using it, you need to look into it. It I, is it it changed my life. I, I I need to look into it because honestly, that's that's the trouble with a lot of my stuff. I'm still doing piece by piece, and I'm still cutting because for me, it's my settings on my side that I have to to fix. So even though I'm talking directly into my microphone, there's some setting in my background that is literally compressing my my audio. So I'm manually doing all of this yep. stuff and so for me to edit an, an hour-long interview isn't as bad as it used to be that's that's for yeah. sure because i'm still doing i'm still chopping as i go but this this descriptor sounds like it's going to be a huge game changer for me as well too so i actually have a i actually wrote up a white paper on everything i do for editing for our spoilerverse network which we haven't talked about yet yeah. um that i get i provide to all of our uh people on our network um, basically, it's, it's a game changer. I mean, editing an episode used to take me at least an hour or more. But once I, I, I kind of automated all this kind of stuff and the way I do it, I mean, editing a podcast and even a video podcast is so passive in the background. It's, it's kind of brainless nowadays. I mean, with, with what I do, could it be better? Sure. Could it be, could it be cleaner? In some places, yeah. Uh, could the video have you know more cool pop-up stuff? Sure. But the way I see it, when you have a, a podcast interview or a video interview like this, nobody cares about the pop up for the most part. They care about the content. They care yeah. about the conversation, not about like, oh, look, he popped up a copy of the cover here at this point. I mean, yeah, that's cool. But realistically, if you're doing a high con high quantity of stuff out there with a lot of people, it's more about getting the, the quality content out there, not about, for my opinion, about having all the fancy stuff. Now, if I had time, I would absolutely do those graphics and pop-ups all the time, but I just don't have time for it. Hearing you talk about this has opened my mind to what the fuck have I been doing for the past couple of years? <laughs> Seriously. Like, because I finally have a queue of interviews, because I've been pushing to interview more people like yourself and like uh, so many talented people, uh, I'm going to be on Bridging the Geekdom with Rob, uh, yeah. yeah, like next next Wednesday. So, or this coming Wednesday, I should say. Nice. So, Robert. I'm, ex I'm, he's amazing. Like, I love his his style of interviews. I love the fact that he's part of the Spoiler Country um, mm -hmm. podcast network as well, too. And the fact that you know, I spent an hour and I watched his interview of you. I, I like, I spent the full hour. I watched the entire yeah. thing. I, I didn't cut. And I found that, you know, just in him and his style of, of approach, he's very similar to both of our styles too. So he's very conversational, very entertaining. But the fact that you talking about what you're doing for editing is going to speed up the what I have in queue, what I have to edit. I think I have at least five or ten, five or six interviews currently that I have to edit. Mind blown. You've, you've changed my life again, Jay. Jeez. Well, it's, it's what I'm here for, man. And it's, it's like I said, it, it changed my life for editing when I, when I, when I figured all this stuff out and I was like, man, editing is not a chore anymore. It's, I mean, it's still a little bit of chores to have to do it, but it's not like, it's not so like time consuming and yeah. it's, it's great. And but yeah, it's, I'm, I'm glad I could, uh, you know, enlighten you on what I do. And if, if, if you take anything away from it, I mean, I'm happy to, to have shared it with you. You know, you have a large network. You have a lot of great shows on your, Spoiler Country network itself. In listening to past interviews that I've I've heard you talk about, you said that there's five active shows, but there's like ten or so shows that appear every month. Let's kind of do a rundown of your your top five that are 
your your more active ones, and then let's dive into your others as well. So we got uh, you know we got we have about five or six active shows that post regularly every week. We got Spoiler Country, which is the main show, which is you know the one that we talked about before. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got Hard Agree with Andrew Sumner. Um, Andrew Sumner is uh, a close friend of ours. He lives over in London. He's an English guy. Um, he's the EVP for Titan Merchandise. He's been um, a great mentor and friend for us. He has been um, influential in helping us take ourselves from hobbyist to trying to be more professional because he's been in the industry for 35 years doing interviews and working with working in the pop culture like, like entertainment world for 35 years so he's got he brings that to us and he has a great show he goes up every wednesday called hard agree that um he interviews not only celebrities and creative people but also people who work in the industry and talking about their stories like he just interviewed um uh, Steve Ditko's nephew mark Ditko, yeah. about you know Steve Ditko and all that kind of fun stuff he interviewed matt wagner ed asner He's got a really cool one coming up that I can't talk about yet, but trust me, when once it drops, everyone's going to freak out um, what it is. We have Bridging the Geek Downs, which you talked about earlier with Robert and sometimes Colton. Uh, Robert has been a great a great addition to the Spoilerverse Network. He was actually one of the first per- people we ever brought in because Robert and I became friends years ago through a mutual friend, Deej, who hosts a show called Nerdtocalypse. Um, Robert and I started talking. We've been talking nonstop for like two years now. Him and I always bounce ideas. Actually, I'm actually chatting with him right now about a new show idea, uh, at, or it was before he started this. He has a great show, Bridging the Geekdoms. Um, he also has a, he also has a side show called Shooting the Sith, which is all about Star Wars stuff. Which go, which is, it's, a, it's a passive show, um, but it, it posts like when there's Star Wars news and stuff like that. We've got Misery Point Radio with Mike Peacock, which is a music based show. He talks about a lot of music stuff. Um, I've been on that show a couple of times. He talks about he talks to creative people as well about comics, but mostly it's talking to bands in the metal nice. um, rock area. Funny Book Forensics with Dan and Greg, which uh, is a, a deep dive into like getting hella nerdy with comics, like diving into the stories like researching like what's going behind the panels like you know kind of stuff it's, it's a great show uh they have a lot of fun dan is definitely the more serious one and greg is the the funny one they get some great stuff and i, I feel bad because dan and greg i owe you and i they've want me they've asked me to come on the show and every time i do schedule it i have to reschedule it because something comes up and i owe them to be on the show and i'll be on there soon but it's it's a, it's a if you haven't listened to that show yet it is, it is a really good show we have narrative gunslingers which is um same greg again and uh, uh travis where they kind of talk to somebody about talk to creators about um not only their work but about um a, a piece of work that they really enjoy and they kind of like narratively deconstruct it and then we have uh nurse in the crypt which is a horror like a horror movie based comic or no, horror, not comic podcast um hosted by sal and uh there's a Greg's on that one as well, and I've been on that one before and there's a bunch of other people on that one that are great uh, they kind of dive into horror movies and horror concepts and comics and they're a lot of fun um and that's kind of like our active podcast. We have several passive ones. Like uh, we have my other show that I do with my wife called Half Hazard Adventures, which we post maybe every other month-ish. We'll go in spurts. Like we won't release for a month or two. Then we'll release like five episodes in a month. And it's mostly because that pod, that show literally lives around our lives. It's um, us going through life and talking about, you know, house buying or kids, going to shows, concerts, music, just things that interest us. It's basically my wife's and I are my way to sit and talk and record it and have a good time. And, and it's, it's a lot of fun. We bring people on for conversations sometimes. I mean, you've been on that show. That show is, <laughs> that show is rebranded from the old, the old white to see radio. You were on that a long time ago. It was but, uh, nipple rings, by the way. I still remember yeah. that. Oh yeah. What's I'm, I'm getting those done again here pretty soon. So <laughs> uh, that'll be fun. <laughs> I've got the, I have white to see radio, which I took that name from that show and made another thing out of it, which is just uh, me talking about topics it posts probably once a month or so. And it just whenever I have time to sit and talk to myself, I find a topic or something I want to talk about. And I just kind of ramble off my brain about that one. We have Nerd Talk Clubs on the network as well, which uh, they they post infrequently. Uh, they used to post pretty regularly, but it's uh, it's Deej Ben Hollow, um, and his co-host talking about nerdy stuff. We've got Witty on America, which is a passive show, which is hosted by um, Sal from Nerds from the Crypt, which is about him and his wife going through the process of infertility. And we've got a couple other shows that are, are kind of like not running right now, but we'll, we'll probably come back in the future. And then we've got a couple of new shows that are um, talking to us to come on the network that are more active shows uh, that we're in the process of talking to. I think we have two current people we're talking to for that, that have come to us or we have talked to you about joining the network nice. um, that are both pretty active, um, which would be pretty cool. And, and both the shows I'm a fan of, I like both of them a lot. So I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I'm hoping they both work out. You got to keep growing it. Obviously you're, you have so much content to put out there and it's going to overflow to the masses to say, Hey, look, you know, these shows are, are extremely active. These shows are in your real house to listen to, you know, why aren't you listening to it? So, from a promotional standpoint, this is obviously the most difficult aspect, especially being 
a host yourself, you understand the pain <laughs> of this particular side of things. But because you have a network now, is it easier for you to promote these various shows? It is. It really is. Um, it's and it's something that we're working on because I, again, the network was accidental. We didn't we didn't go plan out to do a network. Uh, the network just kind of happened um, because once we started doing the podcast and it picked up a lot, we had people ask us to help out, and we said we said sure, help out, and that turned into like. Uh, we had people with other shows and we all wanted to like work together. So the network came out of that. Um, but yeah, with the other shows, it becomes easier to cross promote. Like, I mean, it's, it's easy for me to mention on Spoiler Country. Hey man, if you like this conversation, go check out Bridge and the Geekdoms or, you know, go check out Music Point Radio if you like music. Cause it's easy to cross promote. Um, and one of the things we're working on is creating little like 30 second video ads for every podcast that can be dropped into the show. Cause a um, little marketing tip for anybody out there. One of the things you want to do, and we're working on this, we don't, we don't have this in place yet. Um, but really, if you have a podcast, video or non-video, you should have two or three ads in your podcast every episode, whether it's a paid ad or an ad for yourself or something you're promoting. Um, you should always be promoting something, whether it's yourself or somebody else. So we're working on for any, if we're working on for now, uh, doing ads for all of the shows and stuff in network. That way, every episode has at least one thing promoting somebody else on the show. Um, that, you know, somebody may be, may be listening to you, funny book forensics, but not know about prison geekdoms, you know, and they hear the ad and they go, Oh, cool. I'm gonna go check that out. I mean, I found lots of podcasts from other networks who are, who were promoting a podcast in their network. So it becomes easier to promote that way. And also doing a guest appearance on one of the other shows is a great way to, to promote. Like if I have, we have Robert come on Swole country. It's a great way for him to promote his show, you know, stuff like that. Or if you came on to our show, we could promote TGT really easily, totally. you know, like that. And I'm, you know, I'm always up for that. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I know. <laughs> it's all about scheduling. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's, that's the unfortunate part. You know, life always does get in the way. What's the wisest thing that you've ever heard someone say to you? Oh man, the wisest thing. So it probably would be when I was told that I can't do everything that I have to delegate to company that as well would be that you should in any field that you're working in, um, as far as like a creative field or something you're trying to create, uh, you should be working to replace yourself. Um, because you can't grow more if you're still doing the same shit you're doing you started with. You have to find someone to replace what you're doing. Like if you're doing like right now, I'm doing all the editing. If I want to grow the network and the podcast, I need to replace myself so I can focus on the next thing. You can never go to the next thing if you're still doing the first thing. So it, it's, I mean, that'd be the wisest thing I've ever heard is, is work to replace yourself. And eventually you replace yourself and you have everybody else do all the work and you're reaping the benefits and doing what you want to do. What's uh, one mistake that you'll never ever do again? Oh man, like in, in the, the professional world or in the personal world? <laughs> Let's go into both. I don't know. I, I've made a lot of mistakes. One that I'll never do again, professionally, uh, probably, and this, this is actually professional and personal, probably scheduling interviews for 6 p.m. on a work night where my wife says I should have dinner with her instead, the family. Um, that's always, in, that always ends bad. <laughs> I don't fear mistakes. Um, I, I feel like mistakes are needed to learn. Uh, obviously you don't want to do them again. I don't want to, um, screw up and have you know keep doing it over and over again i would say in the podcasting world the only real mistakes i've ever made are not learning how to promote earlier but it's not something i can do again because i'm not going to be there again but i think that if you don't make mistakes with what you're doing you're ne you'll never learn anything as far as how to get bigger and how to how to how to grow i mean it's not really a great answer it's kind of a roundabout answer to your question but i don't really have any mistakes that i've made in the podcast world now, if you're talking about comic books in the comic world, I would say uh, the biggest mistake I ever made was trying to do too many and too much at once mm -hmm. to learn how to focus and try and like narrow it down, which is one thing I'm trying to do now where I'm not trying to take, I have a lot of ideas up here, but I'm trying to do them kind of, you know, more in order and more succinct and not just like all at once. When I had 11 web comics going at one time, which was insane, which you told me was insane. And I told you, no, it's fine, but no, you were right. It was insane. I still never understood how you survived those early years doing 11 web comics. I, that's still... I have never talked out of all the people I've talked with when it comes to web comics specifically, I've never known anyone else in that industry to do more than just one or two comics at most in their lifetime. Yeah. And you did 11 and I'm just like, how are you still one still sane and two still awake? Cause honestly, I don't know how you've survived those early years doing all that truly. I don't know if you remember 2016 when I came on your show to talk about the relaunch of YTCL.net and all yeah. that kind of stuff. But um, I told you in the beginning of that, that was, I talked to you in like January, February time frame, and I told you I had a goal of posting a thousand web comics in a year mm -hmm. and it told me I was insane. And I said, yes, I know, but this is how I want to stop. I want to retire after web comics after doing a thousand in a year. 
and I did it. I did a thousand and six in the in in one year, one calendar year. It was brutal. It was insane, and I will never do it again. It's partially why I've never done, I haven't done a web comic since the end of twenty sixteen. It's because I spent a year doing a thousand pages in one year, and I was like, I am so done. Um, I was doing a daily hand drawn strip that year for some stupid reason on Instagram, which did really well. But I did that and everything else. Yeah, I don't know how I got through it either. Uh, again, it was the whole desire to constantly be creating. Um, but I, the mistake there was back then was doing too much at once, too, too many different things at once and not kind of like trying to focus that down to a more succinct, like putting a lot more of that effort into one thing, one or two things versus like 11 things, obviously. I mean, I'm sure if I would have focused more on like one to two other web comics, I could have, they would have been a lot better quality, I guess. Um, I mean, I still stand by what I made back then. I still enjoy what I made back then. Uh, but I probably could have made them better had I been more focused on one to two, not 11. Yeah. Well, I mean, life lessons. You, you live yeah. and you learn, plain and simple. Hindsight's twenty twenty and all that jazz. Exactly. But I can tell you, honestly, I don't know anybody who's ever ran a learning comic at once. No. <laughs> no, you are, you are truly uh, a, a testament to what you can do with a massive amount of creative focus. In, and insanity in coffee. And insanity in coffee, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but before I do that, is there anything else that I've missed that you'd like to share with those that are watching or listening to this show? Go to spoilerverse.net, check out all this stuff, really. Uh, if you have thoughts or comments on what we're doing, let us know. I'm always open for feedback. Um, that's really it. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? So my biggest inspiration for my life is my dad. Um, put the creative bug in my brain um, as a kid. He uh, got me synced on pop culture and comics as a kid. He's the reason why I love comic books. Um, you know, he's the reason why I got into music when I was in, in, in high school and junior high. Uh, it, it really was, it was him who, him and my mom too, to some degree. Uh, but my dad had the creative bug as well. He, he was a musician and stuff like that. Uh, he pushed me to, to follow what I wanted to do, you know, and I did. From a professional standpoint, you've been a webcomic creator with over 11 web comics, still <laughs> insane. You're also the host of a great show and, and you're the co-creator of the Sparla Country Podcast Network. You've done such a lot in so many varying industries. Do you consider yourself personally successful though? I do consider myself personally successful. Um, I, I'm very proud of everything I've done. Uh, from my first web comic in 03 to the podcast that I created in 2017 to the network in 2019, to all that stuff I've done. Um, I think it's great personal success as far as, uh, as that goes. I mean, I love what I do and I feel like um, other people enjoy what we do as well. So that's a huge win for me. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Uh, at first, it makes me mad. Um, if I fail something, I get upset like anybody I really would. Um, um, but I try and look at the failures that I make and, and turn them around and see what I can learn from it. You know, uh, it's a learning process. Everything's a learning process. If you fail at something then you know what not to do next time, uh, I'm not always the best about not repeating it again. Sometimes, uh, sometimes I have to fail the same thing twice to learn it, you know, just like an idiot. But I, uh, you know, I look at failure as a mode of what I did wrong to success. And I firmly believe in life, not just creative, but in anything. Um, you learn more from a failure than you do from a success, right? If you have to go out and try and do something and you fail the first time, the next time you do it, you're going to do it better because you know what not to do. So I look at failures as a way to succeed better the next time. The younger generation is looking at your work. They're becoming inspired by what you are doing creatively. Maybe they want to become a podcast host or maybe they want to become an editor, whatever they'd like to do. Obviously, you have the younger generation currently with you. So they're being creative by technology in their own way. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I think it's easy. Uh, if you want to do something, you just do it. Uh, learn how to do it. Get in there and get your hands wet. And if you want to inspire people to do it, you do it with a positive attitude and you do it, you do it with good intentions. Um, you get out there and you, you create things you want to, you would want to consume, right? If there's, there's two modes of creating, right? You can create for money. You can create for content, right? You can create for yourself. Or you can create to make money. Um, either way, if you do it with passion and love, you're going to get, you're going to create good stuff. And the best way to inspire people behind you for the next generation is to show them that what you're creating is you're creating for a purpose and, uh, you're doing it with, with love and passion, no matter what it is. 
As always, John, you know, I hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Um, I'm glad you're doing well. I'm glad you're creating a, a great creative network that you are when it comes to all these amazing podcasts that you have. Uh, we'll definitely get you on in the future. And, you know, as always, if you ever need another co-host interview, whatever, just toss me a link like you have in the past and I'd be happy to help you out. Oh, I definitely will. And I'm going to have you come on the show to chat with Kenner Give me on, on our show sometime soon, too. That'd be awesome. Well, uh, check out, of course, Jay's work and, of course, everything that he's done on his website, uh, scpod.net. It's in his lower third. And, of course, as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell, and it's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening watching on Two Geeks Talking, where who knows who our next geek is going to be, but I'm sure you're going to enjoy whoever they are. Thanks a lot.